It's been a while, but let's make another video. And this time, I'm not talking about tabletop role-playing games. I know! Didn't expect that, did you? No, this time I'll be talking about history again. But if you're a fan of tabletop role-playing games, don't go anywhere, because next time might be very interesting for you. Anyway, this video is the next chapter in the history of Belgium. The thing is, it's been so long since the last episode that in the meantime, an entire TV series about the history of Flanders has come and gone. It's called Het Verhaal van Vlaanderen, and at the moment there doesn't seem to be any way to watch it outside of Belgium, much less if you don't know any Dutch. So there's not much of a point in talking about it on this channel, but I would be remiss if I didn't. So I'm gonna keep it short. Basically, if you're interested in the history of Flanders, I do recommend it. It's far from perfect, but I do think it's about as good as it could be, considering that this was made for a general audience, with tax money, and almost certainly from Flemish nationalist motivations. Like, I was expecting it to be a lot of propaganda, but it wasn't really. There's a couple of cases I saw where they told the story in a way that I don't think is entirely fair or accurate, but I do understand why they made the choice to tell the story that way. Everything considered, I think it's a good place to start learning Flemish history, but it's not nearly enough. Because it's not in any way the entire history of Flanders, that's pretty much impossible anyway. But the series is not a chronicle of everything that happened in this area. It's an anthology of the best and most meaningful stories. Though I will admit that they are told very well. So if you don't expect too much from it, I'm sure you'll have a great time. That being said, let's talk about the history of Belgium. Hello there, I'm Judith, welcome to my channel. So the time has come for the next stage in our journey through the history of Belgium. Now, where were we? Well, if I recall correctly, the marriage of Mary of Burgundy and Maximilian of Habsburg just unified a significant chunk of the European mainland. Kinda. Well, not yet, but Max was next to be the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and Mary was the last of the Burgundians, so she ruled Flanders, Brabant, Burgundy and a bunch of other places. Basically the Low Countries, which she actually unified in 1477 with the so-called Great Privilege. So that means that their kids would rule all of the Low Countries and the Holy Roman Empire. Because that's how feudalism works. So who were their kids? Well, they had three. Philip the Pretty, not to be confused with a French king with the same name, who lived over a century earlier, Margaret of Austria, and some dude called Francis. Now, their political marriages had served the Burgundians well, and they'd actually brought them to a whole new level on the European game board. Because of their link to the Habsburgers, they were suddenly able to aim higher and broader like Spain. You may have heard of two rulers called Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile. I won't go too deep into it because this really isn't Belgian history anymore, but they were pretty important. If you want to know more, ask your local history teacher. Well, those two had a daughter called Joan, and Philip the Pretty ended up marrying her. And that's how the Spanish dynasty came into the mix. Now, Joan was not actually next in line for the Spanish throne, but because of history, she did end up there. Now, there's a whole story here with a lot of drama about how the men in her life straight up fought over who got to rule true Joan, even though she was literally the queen, and in the end she was said to have gone insane when her husband died. The bottom line is that as soon as Philip died, she was considered unfit to rule. And until her death in 1555 CE, she always had a regent ruling in her stead. And if we're honest, that would drive anyone insane. 
So when Phil died, the reign of the Low Countries, which is pretty much modern Belgium and the Netherlands, passed to their son Charles V. Thing is, he was only six years old at the time, so they needed a regency period. Not to be confused with the British regency period in the early 19th century, though the idea is actually very similar. Anyway, the States General of the Low Countries, which was an assembly that the ruler could call together, of representatives from all the different states and provinces in the Low Countries, because keep in mind that all of these little states still exist separately, and kinda just happen to be unified because they coincidentally have the same ruler. For now. So the States General asked Maximilian, Phil's dad, to be the regent, and he appointed his daughter Margaret, so the aunt of the young Charles as regent, at least until he turned 15 in 1515, when he took the throne in his own right. Fast forward a little bit, and by 1519, Charles had lost all his remaining ruling ancestors, gaining the reign over their lands, uniting a huge chunk of Europe under his own reign. Of course, all of Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, and the 17 provinces of the Low Countries is a bit much to rule over. So Charles talked it over with the States General and they decided to simplify things a little by at least uniting all of the Low Countries. So in 1549 he issued the so-called Pragmatic Sanction, declaring the Low Countries to be one inseparable unit. Long story short, the Low Countries are united and ruled by the Spaniards. Now, this is also when the capital shifted. You may remember that for a long time, monarchs had ruled in itinerant kingship, which means that they travelled around the whole country without really having a central city or palace. Well, that started to change with the Burgundians, and Mechelen became kind of the most important centre for states' finances and court of law, with the Great Council of Mechelen. Not the most creative name, but it is clear. So some of the big important things that they needed to govern the Low Countries effectively were centralised in Mechelen, and under Charles, that centralisation shifted to Brussels. So at this point in history, things were going pretty well for the Low Countries. The world was becoming bigger and richer, and a lot of it was because of the Spaniards, meaning the Low Countries were able to benefit from it as well. At this point, Antwerp became a flourishing harbour city, and because all of the Low Countries were now unified under one ruler, it was very peaceful, right? Right? Sadly, no. It's time for about 80 years of war. In 1555, Charles stepped down and left the Holy Roman Empire to his brother Ferdinand, and Spain, and also the Low Countries for some reason, went to his son Philip II. Now, given everything that came before, you may think that Phil and Ferdinand went to fight each other for the whole thing, because that's what usually happens when you split a big empire. But that didn't happen. Instead, the Low Countries went to fight Philip themselves, for their own sovereignty. To explain this, we need to go back to the rise of humanism. It's a whole thing, your local history teacher will explain it far better than I can, but the gist of it is that in the 15th and 16th centuries, European intellectuals started embracing the idea that they shouldn't blindly trust what they're being taught about just about anything. So instead of learning their history and science from what all people dictate, they should go back to the sources, ad fontes, and see for themselves what they have to say. At some point, the idea was also applied to religion, and combining that with all the other things about the church that made people unhappy, new denominations of Christianity came to be. Problem is, the Spanish monarchs were traditionally very devout Christians. Might have something to do with the Reconquista. The point is that there was a conflict brewing in Europe between the Catholics and several kinds of Protestants, in the Low Countries mainly Calvinism. Now, what that means is that while Catholic clergy were going around taking everyone's money, 
worshipping idols and basically acting as a middleman between the people and God, Calvinists didn't like that, saying that everyone should read the Bible for themselves, cut out the middleman, and have a personal relationship with God. I think you can see the problem. Like, that's a powder keg waiting to explode. And it did explode, in 1566. In an episode known as the Iconoclasm, Calvinists all over the Low Countries went into a frenzy and destroyed the statues of saints and an awful lot of other material patrimonium of the church that they felt were idols or representations of the heretical church of Rome. Phil didn't like that. In fact, he sent General Fernando Álvarez de Toledo y Pimentel, the Duke of Alba, big choice of names there. Let's just call him Alva. So he sent that guy as regent to the Low Countries to deal with all this. And he dealt with it by founding the so-called Council of Troubles, which was essentially a court of law meant to find and prosecute the heretics of the iconoclasm. It was quite literally the Spanish Inquisition. Now, this wasn't the only course, because history doesn't usually work that way, but you can imagine that this didn't help in making Phil liked in the Low Countries. In 1581, he got to the point that the States General of the Low Countries decided that Phil was a bad ruler, who disrespected the rights and freedoms of his subjects, making him a tyrant, who didn't get to rule. So they issued the so-called Plakat van Verlatingen, or Act of Abjuration, which is basically a declaration of independence in 1581. Of course, Phil liked that even less, and so they began a war. On one side, Philip II and a bunch of Catholics who felt that he was right, and on the other, the Geusen, Protestant rebels who wanted the Low Countries to be its own state. The war was long and hard, as wars usually are, but in the end, the northern half of the Low Countries managed to split off from Spain and formed a republic, now known as the Netherlands, which basically means the Low Countries. The southern half, pretty much modern-day Flanders, remained Spanish, and somehow became even more Catholic than it was before. In 1598, Phil transferred sovereignty of the Low Countries to his daughter Isabella and her husband Albrecht who also happened to be the grandson of Ferdinand, that brother of Charles V, who got the Holy Roman Empire back in 1555. After they both died though, the sovereignty went back to the Spanish monarch, and in 1648, Spain finally accepted the split. So while the whole of Europe was bursting into wars, the Spanish Low Countries were ruled by Spanish representatives, it was largely treated as an extension of Spain, except they didn't care quite as much about it, meaning it made a great spot to have battles. In the process, Louis XIV of France managed to conquer some of the Low Countries for France, which is why French Flanders exists. And then the Spanish War of Succession came along. Basically, in the year 1700, the King of Spain, Charles II, I'm not sure why the second comes after the fifth, but I'm sure it makes sense. Well, he died without leaving an heir, and there were a couple of people who were very keen on being king of Spain, or at least having him on their side. Long story short, war. It ended in 1713 with the Peace of Utrecht, in which the sovereignty of the Spanish Low Countries was transferred to the Holy Roman Empire, aka the Austrian Habsburgers. But I'll leave that for the next episode, because I'm running out of time. Time for the YouTube thing. You know the drill, everything you can do to help the channel is in the end screen right here. Any corrections or additions to what I've been talking about are of course very welcome down below. If you don't know what to comment, have a look at this. Did you actually like this episode? Were you able to follow everything? Because that was a lot, and I'm not sure I'm following myself. Thanks for watching!